Hi everyone. It, I'm I'm Ray Berry. I'm the palliative lead, and it's nice to nice to be here today and meet some of you. I think uh, fortunately not in person, but for the first time meeting some of you. Uh, hi Eric. I, it's not, er, her. It's nice to it's nice to actually see you in person. That's fantastic. We'll we'll chat again soon. Um, so yeah, I, I'll get started. Uh, I think it's about almost uh, almost ten after. So we'll get started. Um, Palliative care is obviously a very large topic, uh, so I just had to decide where I wanted to focus. Um, uh, you know, palliative care can start obviously from early diagnosis, many discussions with the patients, uh, goals of care discussions, um, all these things. So the many things that I could talk about, but I decided today to focus on a few things that you could take away maybe with some very practical points. And uh, I'll put my screen up. I'm going to talk about the actual last hours of life, and uh, I explain why I want to talk about that um, specifically. Let me just make sure I get my screen properly up here. Is that uh, that shared properly? I, I'm going to assume yes. It um, it's working. All good? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so last hours of life, I, I find this really important. There's, it's, you know, we look after people in palliative care often over many months, but the last hours are when it really, like, this makes or breaks the entire experience for people. This is a, this is a time when people actually take this with them for so long afterwards. If, if this goes, if this goes wrong, this stays with people for months. And so it's really important that we focus on this and get this right. Um, there are many, uh, many symptoms that come up in the last hours of life. And I'm just going to look on a few of them. Obviously, pain management is very important, but that's a really whole talk on its own. I'm going to leave that aside. Sometime we can cover more uh, end of life pain, but I'm going to focus on a few other things. Um, so I say it's the most important time. This is the day that's remembered most by the entire family. Uh, despite the whole time that they go through with all their diagnosis and all of their treatments before this last day. And if you get this right, families just, you, you can't do enough for people other than to get this day right. So it's really essential to control the symptoms at this time. Um, I said, if, if a family feels that doesn't go well, there's long lasting distress. People have come back to me when things don't go well and they just dwell on it for a long time. So, and this distress is shared by the entire care team uh, if this doesn't go well. So um, with appropriate care though, this last day can be an extremely rewarding uh, and yeah, very comfortable experience for the family and, and very meaningful. Um, I think most people will be aware of when we are, when we're getting to that point, all the signs uh, just to review them. Uh, these are things that you see, and this is really helps alert you to that last, uh, really that last 24 hours. Uh, it's kind of important to identify this. We can't always identify it. Uh, obviously, sometimes people just uh, just die quickly, uh, but often we'll see these signs of impending death, the mottled skin, looking at the hands and the extremities uh, for that purplish modeling. Uh, inability to swallow, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, decreased urine output, the change in breathing pattern. Uh, which I'm going to get into in a little bit more detail. Uh, people often become restless. I'm going to talk about that symptom as well. Uh, and then you see that glassy, unfocused gaze, uh, and you'll maybe see some increased respiratory secretion. So when you see all this, you know you're getting to that point, and this is when really people need uh, very aggressive, actually, management at this point. Um, mentioned decreased oral intake. Uh, Again, this could be a whole talk in itself. The, the key thing for this is to really anticipate uh, that this is going to happen. Uh, if it happens, when it does happen, and it's always going to happen, people don't have oral intake at the end. Uh, families are quite anxious about this. As I'm sure you know, right? This is when we get asked, oh, what do we do now? They're not eating. Do we put in an IV? Do we put in a feeding tube? Uh, the most important thing to remember with this is really to address this ahead of time. I find when the families know this is going to happen, they are much more relaxed about it. So I really explain this is what's going to happen. They're not going to be able to eat and drink. Um, it's obviously it, it has a lot of meaning. Uh, food and 
this is one of the biggest things we have discussions with, and probably I spend more time on this than almost anything else talking about how to how to explain why why we don't give IVs or feeding tubes, uh, or we try not to. Um, food has so much meaning, right? It's how we give it's how we give love. It's how we give caring. Um, there's a lot of cultural connections to food, so uh, I really spend a lot of time. Uh, with my with my patients beforehand explaining why this is going to happen and the big thing and again this would be a, a whole talk there's the body is in a catabolic state right so it's just explaining to families it's not that they they're not getting weaker because they can't eat it's they're getting weaker because their body is in a catabolic syndrome uh, catabolic state so the uh this thing that's going on with advanced illness is anorexia cachexia syndrome. Um, again, that would be a very interesting talk in itself. And I have done it uh, talking about the metabolic changes that go on. And it's, it's great if you can explain this to families um, that what's happening is that the body cannot process the food. They cannot process the, the, me the metabolism the body needs to take it in is no longer working. So even if we give food, people lose weight, people break down. Um, if we give fluids, they can't use it even because they're not pumping well. And what happens, as we know, if we give fluids at this state, uh, they get chest congestions and edema. And uh, so it's really important to go over this ahead of time uh, because, you know, it can be rather abrupt where people don't start, you know, stop eating and drinking. And the families want to think, well, this must be what's going on. This must be why they're weak. It makes sense to people. It's very intuitive. Uh, as people are not eating and drinking at the end of life to say, this must be why they're weak and explaining, no, uh, they can't eat or drink anymore because their body's telling them it no longer processes it. Uh, and most of the time that works. Uh, it's quite important not to, not to give this because the other thing to explain to family is we often increase distress to the, to the patient. And we know that, uh, we have lots of studies, which you can go over people to some degree to explain that this does not, giving these interventions at, at the end of life stage does not prolong their survival and actually increases their distress and, and symptoms, especially, especially with fluids, uh, where we just always see chest congestions and edema. Uh, if you, if you do get to the point, and we all do, right, where a family just can't accept this, even at the end of life, they cannot imagine that they're a uh, family member is is dying without any intake at all. Um, I do give it. Uh, we can give, you know, this is after having all these discussions when you've really discussed with the family and explained explained what's going on, explained why it doesn't help, explained how it may, may worsen symptoms. Sometimes you do have to give it. Uh, just families are just so distressed about it. And uh, we give uh, sub-Q fluids, usually in palliative care. It's hypodermoclysis. I use very low rates and 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 tell them how I'll be monitoring for you know increased chest congestion. And most of the time, uh, after a, a day or so of that, and maybe the patient may even die, uh, you know they'll they'll realize it's not helping, and uh, and you can usually move on from that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with with giving it in those states. And sometimes we all have times when we have to do it. Uh, obviously, we try not to do feeding tubes or anything like that, but uh, sometimes a bit of sub Q fluids. Uh, goes a long way to help people feel comfortable just the, with the fact that they are getting something. I um, wanted to talk about dyspnea as a symptom just at the end of life because it's it's really, really common at end of life. Uh, obviously, depends on the underlying mechanism and why they're dying as to how common it is. But uh, in all studies, you know, 60, at least 60% of people uh, experience this at the end of life. And it's really feared by patients that, you know, Almost more than anything else, uh, when people ask me what's going to happen, you know, as as their disease progresses or families talk about, it, they say, you know, will they be will they be feeling suffocating? Will they be able to breathe? Probably more fear about this than pain or any other symptoms. So I mean, people are afraid of pain, but dyspnea really scares people. So it's really uh, really important to address this and and to reassure families. Yes, we can address this. Um, there's many mechanisms that go on to cause dyspnea. I'm just listing a few of them. And obviously even the underlying illnesses, you know, uh, cancer into the lungs or carcinomatosis and people aspirate, they have pneumonias, they have all the, all, all the reasons. And um, earlier on, it's worth 
looking at what's the really underlying reason. Because for instance, if they have a pleural effusion, it can be drained or pulmonary edema might be treated with diuretics. At the end of life, uh, it's probably hard to absolutely find the cause. And, you know, we have to really treat probably more just symptomatically. Um, I reassure families that the you know, breathing patterns change uh, and families are often very distressed by that. You might see that anagonal respirations, which are a little more gasping breaths. Um, and I really explain that that's, that's just the natural slowdown of, the, of the, how the respirations are regulated. Uh, it's not the same as dyspnea because uh, families really focus on the fact that they take big, deep, deep gasping breaths at the end and say, no, that's just natural. That's just how the body's taking, you know, processing never carbon dioxide. You don't have to get into much detail, but explain that, no, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for some sort of distress. Uh, and it's hard to tell because, if, you know, obviously people can't tell, tell us and I'll, I'll treat uh, I'll treat it if I think they are distressed, but uh, explain to the family, no, uh, the respiration pattern differences are not, uh, are not dyspnea. Um, the first approach to it, um, obviously I always, you know, we always skip past this sometimes, the non-pharmacologic. Non um, fans are not always possible in the hospital, but I love fans. Uh, you can't always get them, as I said, but uh, there's good physiologic basis for fans. It's really quite interesting. and. Uh, you know, we all know this, you know, when I sometimes put in fans and people say, was the fan going to do it? I'm like, well, we all know every, you know, you don't have to have any medical training when someone can't breathe, you know, you get them air, you fan them. Uh, we know this sort of works. Um, and it does stimulate, apparently does stimulate some response in the body, just the moving air. So uh, I use fans a lot, certainly in the hospice, we have, we have fans and uh, uh, they go a long way to make people feel more comfortable. Um, oxygen. Probably in a lot of cases, it's the benefit is just the moving air, same same as, as a fan, uh, unless they're hypoxic. Uh, uh, we f I find oxygen gets put on a lot of people at end of life, no matter what. Uh, I kind of push back against it. It's not as it's not as natural and as as you know having somebody dying with uh, even nasal prongs on does not quite feel as natural. So I push back against that unless they're hypoxic. Uh, but quite often people just do put this on as they, as they're watching their breathing patterns slow and change, uh, may benefit just from the moving air. Um, positioning is interesting. Uh, people often ask what's the right position and there is no right position. It's just changing position. There's some classic things you'll see where people are sort of, you know, in a tripod position with their people can't do that end of life, but sometimes repositioning does help and you just reposition until you get, uh, until you get somebody feeling more comfortable. Uh, there are breathing techniques that are probably not as relevant to uh, end of life, but uh, earlier stages, uh, physio and breathing techniques can help with dyspnea. Um, so probably my main key point to take away from this is opioids. Uh, there is so much good evidence and it's just completely underused for so many reasons. Uh, and people are afraid of opioids with dyspnea, to be honest. I'd, and I'm sure you've maybe run across that. People feel it's going to slow breathing. It's going to increase uh, as, you know, respiration. So there'll be hypercapnia. And we absolutely know when used properly, this does not happen. And opioids are so underused. Uh, uh, even, even often uh, I'll prescribe them as I'm, you know, consulting on other floors that aren't, you know, the palliative floors. And I'll find out the opioids are not being used because somebody thinks, well, they're not in terrible pain, but meanwhile, they're in great distress with their breathing. So uh, just if I could give a, a real takeaway, use opioids, especially dyspnea at end of life, uh, and probably even earlier. Uh, study I'm just sort of a, putting up here that was that came out a few years ago where they used it for COPD. And this is an earlier stage, but it's, it's an, certainly a, category of patients with severe dyspnea and, and, and uh, we do look at there are a lot of end of life uh, patients with COPD and uh, you know I'll often see COPD patients with you know multiple puffers and all kinds of other you know and their steroids and multiple things and not on an opioid and we have really good evidence that this that this works uh, 
it, it you know, dyspnea is really not treated by the brain as much different than pain. It's a, it's distress. It goes through the same same uh, sensory pathways. So we alter the sensory the central perception of of dyspnea discomfort with with opioids. Uh, so in the study I talked about, it, you know, they did randomize uh, 124 patients with severe breathlessness, and there was cl clinical and uh, statistical significant improvement. I won't get into the numbers, but Definitely it worked and in almost no case was uh, decreased respirations a problem. Uh, there's no, there's really no respiratory depression much with, with uh, opioids if you use them very carefully and titrate up carefully. Uh, and there is no hastening of death for the most part. There's very little hastening of death. You know, at the end stages, it is possible we have to, I, we have to uh, escalate the doses enough that there may be some hastening of death. Uh, the key thing is that uh, that's pretty rare and it's just a, a dual effect that sometimes it is possible there could be slight hastening of death, but you know, if you have to give it for symptoms, you don't worry about that. Um, and But what you can really reassure people is that in, in the studies we've given, opioids do not in this case uh, hasten their death because people are very afraid of that. Um, I'll often see, uh, I'll often see orders uh, that are written to you know to hold opioids in this state. You know, if the rest rate dropped below a certain amount, uh, that's really not a necessary order if you're titrating carefully. People uh, at end of life have very slow rest rates often, often with many of uh, you know long pauses. It's not the time you want to hold this, um, especially at end of life. You really want to keep that going. I. I react really strongly against that because this is you know hold the opioids in their last 24 hours of life if you if you uh titrate your dosing to respirate so continue giving it and give it to uh, give it regularly um there was some there was uh as far as uh, the way opioids work with dyspnea there was a lot of thought at one point uh that there's peripheral opioid receptors in the lung which we know um, and there was a lot of interest in giving this uh, as a nebulized treatment. Um, turns out it does not work as well as giving it systemically. Uh, when I first started treating, that was that was really the, when I first started working in, in palliative, that was really the big thing was to nebulize it. Uh, and that's totally fallen out of favor. And because we, we do miss the uh, altering of the central perception. So we give it, we give it systemically. Uh, how do you give it? Obviously, sub-Q, um, this is just a brief. Start really low. Uh, it uh, You want to start extremely low if they're opioid naive for this, you know, 0.25 milligrams. Uh, consider a standing dose. If it's end of life, just give it every four hours uh, and then titrate it up. Um, that Generally, we use hydromorphone as a first start if there's no reason not to. Morphine's acceptable. Um, there are many other choices. We use fentanyl, and in, in those cases, uh, you know, if there's some reason that the morphine or hydromorphone couldn't be used, that you were, if you were using it, you could. That would be a good. Uh, that would certainly be a good consult for palliative care. And we can help you work through the options. Um, there are adjuvant treatments for this. So, you know, as I said, I want to really focus on making sure you use the opioids for this. Uh, Bronchodilators and puffers, I see so often with end of life, uh, and then, you know, they don't, people can't take them, and I, I, I tend to stop them. Most of the bronchodilators, except I guess for the steroids, uh, really only, only good for true reversible airway disease, and that's not what most people have at this stage. I mean, a lot of people do have underlying COPD, depending on their, and there, there may be some benefit. Uh, I tend to stop them at end of life. Uh, diuretics, we sometimes continue. Uh, we can give, we do give them sub Q, give LASIK sub Q if needed. Um, corticosteroids, I use quite a lot. I said I don't, uh, don't tend to use them in the puffers as much because people can't take it, but uh, definitely uh, we do use, uh, we do use a lot of corticosteroids for end of life uh, dyspnea. Uh, benzodiazepines are quite useful actually. Um, there's nothing worse for than the anxiety you get from not being able to breathe and it cycles right it's a it's a vicious it's a it's a true vicious cycle with this the worse you 
the worse your breathing is, the more anxious you get, the more anxious you are, the, the worse you can breathe. So I sometimes will use benzodiazepines to try and break that cycle when someone is just getting so panicky, um, if they're still alert enough to be panicky. Uh, so you can give those and you can give those again, injectable or sublingually. And I am going to come back to, assuming I have to, on palliative sedation, it is occasionally some, occasionally the dyspnea is so severe, no matter what you do, uh, people are really just having great, this great distress. And it's, it's a terrible thing to watch. Uh, and sometimes you have to sedate. And I'm going to get into palliative sedation just because it's a, it's a new policy, actually, at, at the hospital. And uh, I'm going to touch on that just uh, so you're aware of how, how that's done. Um, airway secretions, uh, just as a, as a related, a related subject to uh, dyspnea. Uh, obviously, this is a big part of end of life. You, you know, you, this is the classic, was used to be called death rattle. I guess some people still know it. And some of my families will even identify it as that to say, oh, is that the death rattle? So it's just the upper airway secretions that build up and you hear them gurgling at end of life. And it can be really distressing to, to the families. Um, I, I mostly reassure people that it's part, it's a normal part of dying process. It, the secretions just build up in the airway. Uh, I talk to people about, you know, just having like water in the hose. It, you hear it gurgling as, as air moves past it, but it's not really caught. It's not really blocking up anything. Uh, it's more distressing to the people listening to it than the, than the patient. Um, but uh, it can cause a lot of distress. Uh, treatment's pretty straightforward. It's anticholinergic uh, medications are, are the standard for this. So obviously they dry up everything. Um, you don't want to use it too much because it dries up, you know, it doesn't just dry up the airways, of course, it dries up your mouth and your eyes. And uh, so, uh, you know, if someone's actually at end of life, none of that is really that important uh, because they're usually unresponsive. So you don't have to worry too much about that. But at earlier stages, if someone's still alert, I, I use these very sparingly. Um, a couple of main ones that are out there, there's obviously also atropine, but there's glycopyrrolate. Uh, somewhat useful. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it doesn't cause the sedation of other anticholinergics. Uh, so that can be useful if the person's still a little bit awake. Uh, I primarily use scopolamine uh, because I, I, it actually does cause the sedation and makes somebody just relax a little bit more. So if it's true end of life, somebody's unresponsive and really gurgly, uh, I give I give scopolamine. I give it I give it by uh, sub Q injection. Obviously, there are patches. I don't usually use those. I can titrate it better with the sub Q. Uh, but if uh, and even if even if they're at home, uh, sub Q injections can be easily given. Uh, yeah, there's this scopolamine patch. You can use atropine drops. Sometimes those are more. Sometimes those are accessible. Actually, you just put a couple of uh, drops under the tongue. Uh, you can suction the mouth, but I, I, I avoid suctioning. Uh, just as a, as an aside, I, I say, I, I avoid this, but I just, some, uh, another study that came out a couple of years ago that I thought was quite interesting on this. Uh, this is a really common symptom that the, uh, and they, they actually even use death rattle in the title, which I probably wouldn't have done, but, uh, it's okay. I guess it, it lets people know what you're talking about. And, uh, this was a study in the Netherlands, and they uh, looked at whether this could be given because it's such a predictable, uh, predictable thing that the people have this uh, increased airway secretions at the end of life. What if we gave, uh, what if we gave scopolamine prophylactically, and and prevented this? And they did find that there was, you know, cut the uh, incidence of this, you know, in half. It, they found about twenty seven percent of people without this had had these secretions, which sort of fits with what I would think is about the, the normal incidence. And they cut it in half. Um, I'm just throwing it out there. It's a thing that you can think about. I, it hasn't changed my practice, uh, but I think some people are thinking about uh, about this because it does distress families. And if you really do think somebody's really at end of life, there may be a reason to, uh, to start this ahead of time just to prevent that. Uh, when someone's at end of life and they're unresponsive, you haven't... Uh, caused any 
harm, I don't think, by giving this ahead of time. But I tend to wait to see if if it builds up. And uh, and even if it does build up a lot, I, I tend to talk families through it and explain that it's just a natural process. Um, the other big thing that has to be treated really well in the last uh, last day or so of life is, is terminal delirium. Um, people, it's very common. It's, uh, it, you don't find, it's not, uh, you don't find an underlying cause typically of this, you know, earlier on, um, especially through their palliative course, delirium is a very common, uh, common presentation. And of course, earlier on, we, we work it up and we try to think if there's a reversible cause, just like anyone, you know, how you would approach delirium. Uh, at end of life, you're not, you're not going to uh, you're not going to identify a specific cause, uh, but uh, it can be quite it can be quite uh, severe and distressing the agitation that people get uh, in the last day or two of life. Uh, obviously, obviously, all the things that cause delirium are going on. Um, who knows what's going on with their, you know, electrolytes and all the things that you might also you know you look at, but we're not going to correct those. Uh, so it's very important to address this and keep someone calm. It's it's not a it's not a good it's not a good way for people to die. So we have to we have to be aggressive in how we uh, treat this. Um, obviously, all the again the non pharmacologic interventions, uh, as much as we can, again in the hospital, uh, try to uh, try to set the environment quieter. Uh, we have a little bit more luck with that, like in a hospice setting where where we have you know, where we can often pretty much get private rooms and set the lighting well and, and have every, every you know, a calm, calm environment. Um, we really try not to ever physically restrain, of course, uh, that would be a very, very last resort. Um, so we use uh, medications and the, and the, uh, obviously the, I don't think it would be any surprise, the mainstay are antipsychotics, uh, you know, it's uh, it's obviously a little bit controversial sometimes using antipsychotics with with agitated delirium. Uh, there's, I'm sure you're aware of some downsides. Uh, at end of life, uh, they are the they are the most uh, effective treatment we have. Uh, Heldol we use uh, we use olanzapine. Obviously, you're not using anything oral. Uh, you can use the olanzapine because it comes in a tablet that disintegrates in the mouth. Um, Heldol is our first step, usually. Um, very, very powerful at, at, at calming this. Uh, the, I'll, I'll mention methotrimeprazine and nosinan because we use it a lot in palliative care. Uh, it's an old antipsychotic, and I'm not sure if you're not in palliative care, you may not even be that familiar with it. Uh, no longer used for psychosis. Uh, it, it's extremely sedating, um, and it's kind of like this dirty drug that, you know, blocks multiple receptors all through the body. So, you know, people don't like to use it, but however, we find it very useful. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was one of the drugs that got caught up as, as many of these things were not being made anymore because no one wanted to make it. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of use and the palliative care community really across the country really rallied to say, this is so useful to us. Um, we find it just calms people so well. It's because it's sedating uh, and it, it probably even treats pain. We know it treat, obviously treats nausea. I'm not going to get a nausea, but it's dopamine blocking properties treat nausea. It's just fantastic at this stage. And we use it as our extra thing to give. Almost always works uh, for, for calming this at the end if, if you know, Heldol hasn't worked. Um, so we go to that quite uh, quite readily. It's it's, it's injectable, and uh, that's a starting dose I gave. But th again, this would be uh, this would be a great uh, consult to palliative care if you were having trouble uh, calming this. We obviously use benzodiazepines as well. Uh, they can worsen confusion, as you know, but uh, we use it. Uh, we use lorazepam, and we do use a fair bit of midazolam in the in these cases. Uh, it's much more. Uh, a bit of an aggressive management to uh, to calm really uh, really severe agitation. Um, 
So I want to talk about a little bit about the really extreme cases at end of life where uh, we've tried to control all the symptoms and they're refractory. And this does happen. Uh, I, I find pretty rarely, honestly, I, I don't have to go to palliative sedation very often. Uh, the things that you might see, most typical thing I see is, is agitated delirium that just doesn't calm. The person's still restless, still restless, no matter what we give. Uh, refractory pain, occasionally. Refractory dyspnea, I talked about, I mean, someone's just struggling no matter what we give. Uh, so if you just can't control the symptoms and someone is really at end of life, what do we do? Well, we have a, we have an approach where we sedate where someone need, may need to be sedated. And most times uh, that's a relief to everybody. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, emergency situations where uh, we find we might have to do this. So I often leave orders for uh, if I think some of these things are going to happen. So uh, the two biggest ones that I say, and it's funny, I talk about emergency situations in palliative care, but there are there are a few. Uh, you know, uh, a massive hemorrhage can be often anticipated. We have, have you know, head and neck tumors, uh, which lead to both of these things, airway blockage and massive hemorrhage, but, you know, something that's bleeding and you're just, or it's eroding into a, an artery. And if there's going to be a massive external hemorrhage, uh, that is so distressing to everybody, uh, in, in sometimes including the patient. So that, uh, we often have orders for rapid sedation in those cases because they're they're terminal, they're quickly terminal, and it's uh, it's not uh, not good to be aware of during those situations. Um, uh, airway blockage, I total airway uh, blockage, which sometimes happens as a tumor is you know in encroaching into the airways and there's very little, and you're just worried about a total blockage. That's a time when Really, none of the other things I, I suggested for dyspnea, obviously we're gonna give opioids and, and some of those other treatments, but in those cases, uh, sedation is the, is the way to go. So we have a new policy for this and uh, it hasn't been put out yet, but I, I thought it was worth bringing it to everyone's attention. This hasn't been actually, there hasn't been a policy at SHN yet on palliative sedation. So we've just put one together. Um, it's, it does, cause a lot of concerns, I think, for staff and for family. So the, the question when you have to sedate someone, they're like, well, if they're not eating, drinking, they're gonna be permanently sedated. Are we actually just uh, hastening their death or is this a form of MAID? Um, and it's not, uh, it's it's really a way of treating, we, we really differentiate. It is to treat the symptoms in the only way that we can. Uh, so it's really important to have that laid out clearly. It's not a, it's not an end round or, you know, sometimes people might want to say, well, if you just sedate them, is that just uh, getting around the uh, requirements that they have to go through for MAID? And, and no, it's not. This is, this is very specific situations where we've really shown that we've tried everything we can for their symptoms and they're severe, they're refractory, and we can't, uh, we can't approach it any other way. Um, so we do have a policy, uh, I would, I would say the the plan for this policy is that they're going to be done on the PCU, so on Tower Six at the General. Uh, if someone, you know, even if we're consulting somewhere else and someone cannot be controlled, uh, we'll have the staff on the PCU that can do this. So we would transfer them. Uh, also, there's there's some specific uh, nursing skills that are needed to do this properly. Uh, so as as I mentioned, it's not a substitute for made. Uh, I have had people sort of suggest that they could do that, just just sedate them, and we're not going to, you know, go through the applying for MAID. And I'm like, no, that's not, uh, you know, if their symptoms are controlled and they are otherwise fine, we don't just put someone under sedation. Um, the interesting thing about it, and also uh, in relation to MAID, is that multiple studies have looked at if someone does need palliative sedation for, you know, intractable symptoms. Uh, what is the effect on patient survival? And the interesting thing is survival is the same or even better if you sedate someone at this stage. Uh, this is usually almost always given in the last two weeks of life. And that's where we, we try to focus. If someone had a longer prognosis, uh, 
for other for some reason we thought the prognosis was longer than two weeks uh we wouldn't really consider palliative sedation we'd really keep working on uh on symptoms but if it's really at the end of life uh we find that sedating someone probably uh compared to not sedating them they survive and uh live about the same amount of time so uh you can you can really reassure people that uh this is not uh this is not uh specifically given to end life um so just differentiating those uh made which i'm sure i don't really need to just do uh define that but it's a deliberate termination of life by a very active intervention to end end life and palliative sedation uh very different utilized for refractory suffering and intent is very important uh the intent is to provide symptom relief and the intent of palliative sedation and it's really important to go over this with families the intent is not to end their life you explain to families that they're in they are approaching end of life due to their illness and that the sedation is not uh not being given to end their life but to treat their symptoms and, and keep them comfortable as they are dying from their from their illness um how do we give this uh there's several different uh protocols uh the first line we all we almost always go to most people will go to is midazolam infusion um it has to be given by an infusion uh due to its uh very short half-life uh, so we we infuse it and and follow and there's monitoring tools that i'm, I'm not going to get into the details now but we monitor the level of sedation and how sedated someone is uh and titrate along with that and it's just a, a constant reevaluation of getting them on a dose that controls the symptoms you're trying to control keeps them calm and we, so we you know we'll start we'll start you know low like 0.5 or 1 milligram an hour of midazolam and titrate up as needed um we'll often use that along with nosin as i mentioned uh, or or if we need to we we try nosin and uh, there's also protocols for using that it's given uh, more intermittently, not usually as infusion, but fairly frequent intermittent uh, dosing. Lorazepam is used, right? It's often more, it's often more available. Uh, there are other protocols. Phenobarb has a protocol for it. Uh, and in really refractory cases, we have some stronger, uh, stronger medications like propofol, but rarely need to use them. I, again, that would be a time where you'd really be consulting and uh for for someone in extreme distress so um that's mostly what I wanted to talk about with uh with that today and I thought maybe just as I had a few moments I just uh uh mention how our palliative care team is is changing and growing at, at SHN um you will have seen if you're on the floors uh a much more increased team uh, we have uh, 10 physicians now on staff at the hospital. We had, uh, we had I think, three or four before. And, and, and those people, as you, as you may know, are mostly all still there. Uh, but we're expanding the team, so you're going to see a lot more people. Uh, the need for palliative care is great. Uh, most, uh, there's so many people in hospital that could benefit from a palliative approach to their care. And we're certainly wanting to be able to help you with that and help guide that. Uh, we're building our community team as well. We now have nine physicians on a community team uh, providing 24-7 coverage. Uh, and the plan, which uh, you'll be seeing rolled out, which is really, I think, really exciting for Scarborough, is we're developing a seamless program with the exact same team. So people will be following patients in hospital or home. So some of the physicians will be moving between sites, see someone in hospital, see them back at home, and it'll provide that integrated seamless care. And we're developing clinics and outpatient follow-up. So the uh, uh, the program is expanding and uh, uh, really developing. So uh, if you ever have questions about palliative care, please feel free. Uh, if, I, if I haven't met you yet, uh, I'm the lead and uh, you'll have, and all of our physicians are very approachable. Um, I focus today on, you know, end of life, but uh, it's a small part of what we do, right? The end of life uh, care, it's really important, 
Um, you know, when people think of palliative care, they try to think, you know, are, is this person really at end of life? Should we refer to palliative care? No, of course, uh, we like to be involved earlier. Uh, we really like to talk about the goals of care and working through people, uh, working with people and their families so that uh, when it does get to the end of life, the issues have been dealt with and we know their goals and we know how to keep them comfortable. Uh, so early, uh, early referral, as you see these, you know, it's anticipate someone's probably in their last year of life. It's a great time to refer to us. Uh, it does make this, uh, when, when you do jump in as a palliative care consultant at the, you know, in the last two days of life, it's pretty difficult to establish that rapport where, where families trust you. But earlier on, uh, so early, we, we're, we're developing the capacity to take a lot of earlier referrals. Uh, so I'd encourage you to do that. So uh, can open it up if there's any, uh, any questions on any of the things we've talked about or, or palliative care in general. Uh, can I ask a question, Raymond? It's Eric Hurwitz. Hi, Ray. Can you hear me? I guess not. Raymond, are you able to hear me? Not sure if there's. Can you hear me? Hey, Eric. Hi. Are, are you able to hear me? Eric, I can't hear you. No. Oh. I, I don't know. I'm muted, but uh, not going through. You know what? Maybe I'll. Uh... Oops, this works. Oh, yep, there you are. You able to hear me now? Yes, yes, now I can. Yeah. Just what, what provisions do you make for uh, titrating morphine for those who choose to die at home? Mm -hmm. uh, the sub Q, you know, the, the team may not be able to titrate things quickly enough sub Q to get over to the premises if, if they're involved. Right, right. So at home, we have a couple of possibilities. I often will put in, so the CAD pumps, so the, the pumps that you set up there to sub-Q, I will often use those if I need to try titrate at home. So what you do is a, with the CAD pump, you uh, provide a steady infusion rate. So it's an hourly rate. And then a, you, you attach a little cord with a button that the families can give it. And, and you reassure them that it's given safely that way because you put in the parameters. They can't, you know, they can't push it to 10 times in a minute. It locks out uh, and it allows you to titrate that very carefully because you can you can go back even and check how many have they given how many do they need how many did they attempt uh so cad pumps are probably the most helpful way to titrate at home uh it does require somebody to be able to give it in a family there uh, i do sometimes it's hard to sometimes there's not enough cad pumps available we get cad pumps through the through home care you order them through home care uh and they come in and their nurses will set it up and go over it with the families. Uh, I occasionally will just put in a sub-Q line at home and uh, the families give sub-Q injections. You know, they just attach it to the port. And then what we do is we drop the syringes with the exact dose. Uh, we tell them how to give it, you know, every four hours standing and how to give an extra dose. Um, families can learn how to do that, right? They're not giving, you, you, you know, they're not giving injections. There's a you, you set the sub Q port and uh, it does require a lot of communication back with the family. The nurses go out. Uh, the nurses go out and help them with this. The nurses drop the syringes so they don't they don't have to touch this. Uh, and uh, yeah, between that, between those things, it usually works quite well. Uh, the other thing that that was crossing my mind was uh, was for the families who are apprehensive about morphine and the stigma of uh, ending life early, which probably is omnipresent. Yeah. Do you ever do morphine rehearsals? In other words, you know, to to let the patient particularly experience morphine in anticipation that, you know, if, if you're afraid of that shortness of breath or whatever symptoms are going to arise towards the end of life, mm -hmm. be reassured you're going to be okay. It's one thing to say it. 
It's another thing for somebody to actually experience it. You know, I wonder if that's ever ever done, you know, just as a, as a trial before the last act. That's an interesting thought. I haven't ever done that, actually. Uh, I usually, I do a little bit, like, say, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying it, I'm like, try this out. I'm going to give a low dose. Uh, you know, I almost say, I, I can almost tell you for sure you're going to be happy. You're going to tell me you feel so, you know, I, and I, I will review so many things with them and say, you know, obviously I'll review all the misconceptions about morphine, but most of the time I'll tell people, I will bet you that when you try this, and this is obviously trying it a little bit earlier in your illness, not end of life, but I, you know, say just me, I say, try this because they're afraid they're going to be, you know, knocked out, not breathing well. I say, I bet you, you're going to tell me you have more energy and feel better. And I'm going to check back with you. You're going to try a few doses over the next few days. I haven't actually tried it too much. You know, it's interesting that we heard sort of trying ahead of time would be interesting, but uh, I think your point is maybe use it earlier so that they get a sense of comfort. So when they really need it, uh, we don't have to hold back and wait for, you know, dyspnea to be severe, severe before we try this. Yeah. You know, when they're having moderate, for instance, dyspnea, it's, it's worth using a low dose and, and, and letting people understand, Hey, yeah, I feel better. And even for the family. So they see, you see what yes, happens. very much for the families who are afraid this is going to kill them. Um, uh, it's so common. It's such a common, uh, and sometimes you can hardly get past it. They just will not use it, right? And they'll, and it's it's interesting. Morphine suffers from its association with death so much. Uh, people who are dying need morphine, and you'll often, mo a lot of time, people will say, "Well, I saw it. You know, they started morphine, and they were they were dead the next day." Well, it's because they were dying the next day and needed morphine. But uh, it's hard to get that out of that association out of people's minds. Thanks for the overview. No, oh, thanks. Um. Any other comments, questions? If not, I think, uh, not sure, four minutes to one, we can, we can wrap up. Thanks, anyone. Any, any time you have questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, or the team. Um, pretty accessible. You find my email on the hospital email. Uh, any questions, anytime you need to, uh, any difficulties, not just with symptoms or in the thing, but, you know, negotiating the whole system. Uh, we're working at trying to make it uh, streamlined, as I mentioned. Uh, but if you're having tr trouble, you're not sure where someone needs to go or to look after, even in the community, feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks, everyone.